Hello and welcome to Incoming, a series featuring true stories from the lives of America's veterans, told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnall. We're produced out of San Diego by the literary arts nonprofit So Say We All in partnership with our public media friends at KPBS. And this is the first episode of a very important journey we're all going to go on together, one hour at a time. Because it's the first episode, I wanted to take a moment before we start the show to answer a question that's often asked of us, why a show about veteran culture and why now? Well, for one thing, less than 1% of the entire country serves in the military at any given time nowadays, which is perfectly fine from a national security perspective, according to all the experts on the matter I've been following. But that situation becomes problematic on other fronts once we consider how it might affect our democracy, civilian engagement with foreign policy, or the very social contract that holds us all together as, as a society. What happens during wartime doesn't end when the war does, if the wars of our time ever end anymore, considering that as I'm recording this, we're entering our 16th year of nonstop military engagement. So asking so few to carry a burden so large, one that we've all benefited from, regardless of our personal politics, is not a deal that comes without consequences. It doesn't end when a service member comes home. In fact, coming home is often more dangerous for a lot of people than being deployed. The 22 veteran suicides that happen every day on average demonstrates that fact, a number that far outpaces the rate of casualties sustained from combat or accidents in the line of duty. And until all of us have some idea about who our military is as people and what their lives are like, we're not going to know how to help them. So we started this program to ask questions, hear stories, and learn, because that is what we know how to do. But the other reason we felt this show needed to exist is because veteran culture is stronger and more vibrant and prevalent than ever. Veterans are represented in the arts more than I've ever seen in my lifetime. They're playing important roles in fomenting social and political change across the country. And whenever I've met one of those individuals, regardless of whether they were in for two years or four years or retired after their full 20, their identity as a veteran or service member inevitably has played an important role in shaping their worldview. And it's always interesting to find out and listen to how. That's all to say we're not talking to them because it's ethically imperative, but because what they have to say is compelling and artfully rendered, funny, poignant, surprising, and all the other things you want from good radio. So on behalf of all of our contributors, past, present, and future, thank you for being our audience and making it possible to have this forum where we can all sit down and talk together, finally. Let's start our show. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Goolsby teaches at the United States Air Force Academy and serves as the acquisitions editor for War, Literature, and the Arts, an international journal of the humanities. He's also the author of I'd Walk With My Friends If I Could Find Them, which, in addition to winning the Florida Book Award Gold Medal and Book of the Year from Military Writers of America, was one of my favorite books that I read in 2016. It really got under my skin, in a good way the way that only really raw, honest writing can. In fact, I threw it across the room on more than one occasion while I was reading it because it cut so close to the bone in ways I wasn't prepared for. His book only focuses on brief glimpses overseas with its protagonist and instead goes deep into that fog that covers the years back home trying to reconcile the past with the possibility of having a future. Jesse's going to be reading directly from that to start with, with a piece of nonfiction to follow. And in between, we're going to have a chat. So without further ado, here's Jesse Goolsby. Hi, my name is Jesse Goolsby, and I'll be reading from my novel, I'd Walk With My Friends If I Could Find Them. This is from the first chapter, Be Polite But Have a Plan to Kill Everyone You Meet. Wintrick Ellis, newly arrived, pushes his size eight boot into the spongy ground and feels the subtle give of the earth run through the ball of his foot, up his leg, and settle in his camouflaged hip. Green grass in Afghanistan, he thinks. Water somewhere. He smells damp soil and grass, unexpected but familiar. Little League center field, Kristen in a California meadow, and attempts to make this thick-bladed greenery stick alongside the everywhere suck-you-dry desert he had imagined. Eyes open, everyone, Big Dak says. Although Wintrick knows today is a low-risk humanitarian mission, the words slide him back into his default visceral nervousness, bombs, 
somewhere, everywhere. Already he has been told that roadside means nothing in this country. Big Dax and Torres have shared stories with him, everything from far afield livestock to massive diesel trucks igniting the barely buried hell, not to mention bombs strapped to men, women, children, dogs. Bombs the size of tennis balls, soccer balls, tackling dummies. Under the rising sun, Wintrick replays the refrain repeated among his platoon for each of his eight days in country. Don't go looking for a fair fight. Wintrick watches the relaxed movements of the most experienced soldiers and he feels his body breathe. He pulls out his knife and crouches in the valley amid a mist of gnats. He plunges the blade into the soil and levers up a clump of grass. Silently, he rises and collects his first sample of war in a plastic bag that he fists into a cargo pocket. Nearby, a group of mangy goats bleat in a grove of white-blossomed almond trees, their shepherd talking with the interpreter. For the first time since Wintrick arrived, the wind doesn't howl, and he wonders if any kind of omen awaits in the warming air, but he pushes the thought from his mind when he can't think of a single positive forecast the size of tennis balls, soccer balls. He breathes and rubs his eyes. The shepherd laughs and nods and moves his hand to the interpreter's shoulder, then hugs him. Ten minutes till the party starts, Big Dak says. Going to be hot. Hydrate now. Wintrick observes the men start toward the small mountain of bottled water. Torres passes by and slaps his shoulder. Drink up. Wintrick isn't thirsty, but he keeps his mouth shut. When they say drink, he drinks. He straightens up, pats his cargo pocket, and steps and stops. He looks back at the straightening grass and watches the indentation of his boot print disappear. 10.30 and the children and limbless adults are starting to arrive and Wintrick scans the group heading his way, wondering if he'll be the one ordered to pat them down before the inoculation and prosthetic limb giveaway. He pushes his index fingers into his temples, then removes his camouflage blouse and tosses it on the hood of the dusty Humvee. Big Dax and Taurus have been decent enough to keep him out of trouble for his first week, but they outrank him, and each only has a few months left, so he knows he'll soon be the one palm to body with these incoming strangers. Wintrick studies his two superiors as they watch the arriving crowd, Big Dax towering and thick-shouldered, brick of a chin, dark, random freckles, scarred forearms, hands on his hips. Torres, slim and handsome, black hair, sideburns, flat nose, outline of a mini-bible in his pocket, hands interlocked on the top of his head. Ellis, Torres says, check him, old ones first. Wintrick nods and slowly walks over to the now settling group. The interpreter has his arms up directing traffic, shouting at the dirty and quiet kids to stay in a single file line along an outcropping of beige rocks. The adults are told to wait behind. On his short march over, Wintrick focuses on the adults, most missing a foot, a leg, or a portion of an arm. Light layers of clothing shield their bodies from the late morning sun. Various pant legs and shirt sleeves hang limp. He will have to touch all of these people. Before Wintrick begins the pat-downs, the interpreter says, Don't touch ass crotch. Easy with kids. No problems here. Medicine here. You know these people? Wintrick says. No. So you don't know anything. Seventeen pat-downs later, Wintrick comes to a man who seems whole. Tiny sweat streams around his eyes. Thank you, the man says before Wintrick has touched him. Wintrick glances back at the interpreter who nods, then shakes his head. No problems here, he says. What's he doing here? He's not missing anything. No problems. God damn it. Thank you, the man says. Yeah. As with the others, Wintrick starts with the man's shoulders, pats down his arms to his wrists, up his sides, down from his clavicle chest to his belly, where Wintrick feels something bulging, soft, ball-shaped. He pauses for a moment, and when the bomb vision arrives, he whirls around head down and sprints. In the slow motion frenzy, he hears the man yell something, sees his own arms reach out in front of him, and he knows he will die, right now. 
that the searing blast will take him from behind, open up his back and skull, liquefy his body. He is all heartbeat and screams, BOMB! Takes two more strides and dives to the ground. Behind him, the man has lifted his shirt up to his neck, bearing his torso, pointing at the fleshy protrusion. Nah, the man yells, nah! No, the interpreter says, no, please, nothing, no. Only, he pauses, skin, how do you say it? Wintrick lies face down in the grass. Eyes closed, body flexed. He hears skin and pushes himself up onto his elbows. Big Dax and Torres run toward him. Crazy cells, says the interpreter. Wintrick still hears his heart in his ears, and he squeezes his hands, then opens them. He cut his left hand during the dive and wipes the fine line of blood off on his pants. He stands, still dizzy, and peers back at the man who cups the ball of flesh below his ribs. Wintrick shakes his head and glances down at his palm, where fine dirt is mixed with coagulating blood. God damn, Big Dax says, deep breath. Ellis, breathe. Big Dax touches Wintrick's arm, and Wintrick shakes him off. From the side, children's laughter. Cancer, Torres said. That could be cancer. Ah, yes, says the interpreter, nodding. Cancer. Jesse Goolsby, thanks so much for joining us on Incoming. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So you were a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy as a second lieutenant, and during the Iraq War served as a maintenance officer. Yeah, um, I was stationed in England as an aircraft maintenance officer, um, uh, heading up uh, maintenance on air tankers, KC-135s. Can you speak a little bit about what that experience was like, being at a distance from participating in the war but still having such a role in it? Yeah, it it was bizarre in one word. Um, you're navigating so many things, um, but the things that I didn't anticipate, you know, going through the Air Force Academy and then being commissioned and getting my first assignment, and then honestly being um, being pretty proud and exuberant at, at the start of, of both wars, feeling like I was important to what was going on, but also this odd feeling of feeling safe. Uh, from a distance. And so really dealing with these multiple levels removed from direct action, but also feeling like what I did mattered. And it was bizarre for a number of reasons. One of them, one of which is that I got to basically launch aircraft from England that would go and refuel other aircraft bombers often. And then I would see the results on CNN, and then our tankers would land, and we would repair them. So there was this incredibly bizarre but also fulfilling nature of, and cycle and flow of, of what we were doing from England. But as I said, um, alongside that kind of deep pride and exuberance was this real uh, honest guilt and concern for my brothers and sisters in arms that that weren't safe, that were dodging mortars, that were involved in firefights. And so I remember oftentimes going back to my apartment in, in England and really having these internal battles of, am I really in the, the military? I mean, what forms of culpability do I need to navigate here? And this is outside of the, you know, the moral questions that, that came later but even just on a very clear-cut level of how do I how do I belong to this operation? How do I claim ownership and culpability when I feel uh, so far r removed? And and this odd guilt of being in England, but wearing the uniform and taking pride and and bringing the fight to the supposed bad guys at that time. You mention a lot in your writing in some of your interviews about your your conflicted feelings of towards the conflicts you participated in. What do you think civilians need to understand about the experience service members go through when circumstance dictates that they have to participate in a war that they might be very conflicted about? Yeah, that, what a great question. First of all, I, I would say, and I foot, foot stomp this uh, pretty much everywhere, is that service members and veterans are individuals. 
they bring individual dreams, hopes, fears, political persuasion, um, knowledge of the situation to their perspective. And so everybody's going to have a different reaction. But I remember very vividly, as I alluded to er earlier, defending this notion of preemptiveness in Iraq, f feeling uh, pretty, to be honest at the time, if I'm honest with myself, pretty damn gung-ho about what we, were, what we were doing and why we were doing it in real time. Over the years, that feeling has uh, changed dramatically. It's become much more conflict conflicted with simultaneous pride, but a lot of regret, a lot of looking back and considering if I would have done things differently, if I should have just left the service right away because we were currently engaged in a war that I disagreed with, or if I should stay and find other ways to contribute, questioning what the next war was going to be, wondering if we were in forever war, navigating the morality of day-to-day -day life, but also looking toward the future. And what I would say to civilians looking at all of us as individuals is that a lot of us go through the very similar pressures of deciding what we want to do with our lives. So not only is it, am I going to partake in combat, and our military does a lot more than just combat. There are a lot of positions for policy and humanitarian work, but it's not clear cut as far as if I'm going to participate in this war or not. I mean, we're weighing factors about a life and a job. Yes, there's morality, but there's also job security. There's health care. There is these ethereal notions of service to our country that are deeply rooted in matter. There's pride. There's guilt. There's navigating the gray areas. There's leadership. There are a million different factors for every individual that decides to serve, decides to get out, or decides to continue to serve. And I would just hope that and I think, I think they do. I think, by and large, civilians understand that it's not all guilt and it's not all pride. And that's what makes up a human life. That's what makes all of our lives so fascinating is how do I live my life? How can I uh, support my passion? How can I support my family? And how can I do this the best way possible while keeping my integrity and morality intact? The answer is it's not easy, but there are many pathways to get there. And, and so that would be my message to civilians. All the things that run through your head when deciding on how to live a fulfilled and rewarding life come to every single service member as well as they decide on what to do with their how long to serve and why they serve. This is the beginning of Chapter 9, Redwoods. Seven weeks pregnant and nauseated enough to search for the women's bathroom, Kristen sweats in the Express, 20 items or less line at the Susanville Walmart, and tries to calm her stomach and mind. She regrets the jack-in-the-box tacos she had for lunch, and her mind replays her answer to Wintrick's question about an abortion. I don't know. Married for two weeks, she wears a solitaire diamond ring and a silver wedding band, and while she hasn't asked him, she guesses Wintrick purchased the set from the same store where she now stands and vices down on the shopping cart's handle. She's still acclimating to the minor weight of the set and the protruding diamond, and the inside of her left hand middle and pinky fingers are sore from the new rub. She swallows and fingers the sweat away from her face. She reaches into her purse and grabs the small plastic baggie of saltines she totes around, selects the cracker, and places it on her tongue. Unloading her cart onto the conveyor belt, she surveys her soon-to-be purchases, a whistle, a gray t-shirt, a new sports bra, dry erase markers, a dry erase board with basketball court markings, an iron-on coach logo, the Dead Rising video game, the latest People magazine, three gallons of milk, tortillas, instant coffee, deodorant, toothpaste, and athletic socks. She guesses the Walmart checkout man is new, exhausted, or stupid because he struggles to locate the barcode on everything he attempts to scan. And while she counts out her 16 items before the plastic bar that separates her things from the cowboy-hatted man stuff in front of her, she realizes that the conveyor belt isn't moving, that everything is taking too long for her and her trembling stomach and esophagus. After another cracker and two more minutes of nervous gulping, the cowboy has his total, and he reaches into his front jeans pocket and brandishes a leather-bound checkbook, then asks for a pen. These acts will delay her bathroom entrance by a minute, probably more. Miraculously, 
The second saltine has helped, offering a sliver of reprieve, enough, she thinks, to get her through the check writing. She glances left to the inviting stand of magazines and candy and catches a photo of a sultry grinned Fergie, light blue cosmopolitan, at the top, deep red, the sex he wants, below. Next to Cosmo, Time magazine, Life in Hell, a Baghdad diary. Next to Time, GQ in a flirty grin, the private life of Justin Timberlake. Kristen pops another cracker, her esophagus and stomach downshift from tremble to sway. The checkout man offers an enthusiastic, hi there, smiles and fumbles with the sports bra, turning the garment in his hands, although the barcoded tag dangles near the clasp. Brand new, she thinks. Why in the world they give him the express line? When he fists the first gallon of milk, Kristen says, it's on the front. Thanks, he says, smirking with a hint of newfound annoyance. What team, he says, holding up the coach logo. Basketball, she says, swallowing a cracker. Girls JV, over in Chester. The Chester Volcanoes, he says. Cool mascot. It's then that she spots Marcus 20 feet from her, pushing a cart full of groceries toward the exit with his girlfriend, Stacy. Kristen lowers her head, then peeks back up. There's no desire or longing, just a nervous wish to avoid eye contact. She's heard that Marcus got on with Caltrans as in making good union money, working on the paving crew, and there's a town rumor that Stacy did time for simple assault on a girl over in Greenville who called her a drunk Indian, which, as far as Kristen knows, is a fairly accurate description. Occasionally, Kristen sees Marcus's blue Chevy truck rolling down Main Street in Chester, heading south to the aging valley-bound highways, but he no longer shops at the holiday market, where she still works, preferring, she'd guessed correctly, to make the 45-minute drive to this Walmart. Kristen watches them walk away, Stacy's hand on Marcus's back, her long black hair hanging down to the top of her jeans. Kristen pays with cash and moves toward the exit, but pauses by stacks of on-sale bottled water, Lucky Charms, binders, and dog food. She doesn't want to run into Marcus or Stacy returning their cart or discover that they've parked next to her, so she glances over at the bathroom entrance and grabs another saltine from her purse and peeks at a clock on the wall. She watches the second hand and decides to wait three minutes. She hears the old man greeter welcoming people to the store, and she digs out her phone and sees the background photo of Wintrick and her at a San Francisco Giants game. Her father had given them tickets for her birthday, five rows up from the Giants' dugout. The Pirates intentionally walked Barry Bonds three times, but the afternoon was sunny, and the stadium was even better than she had imagined with the bay right there, the eastbound ocean breeze in her hair, and she and Wintrick each downing two overpriced hot dogs before the fifth inning. In the phone's background picture, Wintrick has his arm around her, and she's tucked into him, smiling under her black and orange brimmed giant's hat. It was that night in an Oakland Holiday Inn Express, sunburned and exhausted and happy, that she became pregnant. Kristen stands near the Walmart exit, one minute into her allotted three. She texts Wintrick that she's about to head home, that maybe they should order pizza for dinner. She knows he won't see the text right away, as he'll be finishing up splitting the pile of wood he hauled home yesterday. It was another example of his four-month role of energy and optimism which Kristen wants to believe can last forever, even if she talks herself into taking everything a day at a time. When she took his last name, it seemed like something she had known would always happen, something inescapable but comfortable. Already her new name sounds familiar, Kristen Ellis. She thinks of Wintrick splitting the wood into fireplace-sized pieces, and she believes the war won't live in him forever, at least not as it has that there are too many things that happen in a life for the past always to live downstage. She believes that people are always someone different the next day. Already she sees Wintrick anew as they laugh together watching Arrested Development, or as he hums while they walk along the boggy shore of Willow Lake, or as he takes in the 4th of July parade, which she hopes one day he'll walk in with the rest of the veterans. Recently, Wintrick has replaced all of the ceiling fans in their place, dropped down to two Oxycontins a day, with plans to kick them all together, and surprised Kristen with lunch, freshly made turkey sandwiches a few times at work. She trusts these things are not signs, they aren't teasers. This is who he is. 
Still, she understands days rarely pass by easily, regardless of his motivation. She navigates this world and lives through the days just as he does. In the past week, she's put in five 13-hour days at the holiday supermarket, changed the oil in their car, and finished the sixth Harry Potter book, all under the stress of work as a new assistant manager at Holiday and the pressing debate of whether to keep this child. Can you talk to me a little bit about that in your capacity as an instructor and an, and an artist dealing with that kind of cloud that hangs over veterans and veteran art? There is no veteran experience. There is no damaged vet narrative. Um, they're all individual and specific. But what we get when, we, when our art and when um, our articles, when everything is projected out into the world— that all veterans um, are damaged in some way. All com pe folks that have seen combat, they must be damaged. I mean, it's almost gotten to a point where if, if you have seen combat and you go forth and succeed and, and deal with your things on your own, um, something must be wrong with you, right? There, you haven't really faced down your experiences. And so all I would suggest is that we seek out art and we seek out conversations and manifestations of individual experiences across the spectrum. That is not to say we prioritize one over the other. God knows we need the VA to step up. God knows we have veterans that need help and need our support, and, and the government has been lacking in that. But we also have incredibly successful veterans in business and in personal life, and especially humor, man. We were talking about humor. Serving in the military, I mean, if you read Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, he's great at this on in how to tell a true war story and the things they carried. You know, war is um, tragic and devastating, but it's also insanely, it's insanely bizarre. There are moments of incredible boredom there are moments that are hilarious. So it's that full spectrum of the experience that I think serves our country, our artists, our citizenry really well when we investigate the wide net of those types of emotions. This piece is titled Darcy, a personal essay. Mom, I'm not sure if I have this right, but I think your last words to me were, go to Colorado. By then, your voice was thin and your body failing, but I moved close to you where you rested on our green couch and you touched my arm. I didn't know this would be the last time I would hear your voice, but still, I listened carefully. I was 17, and I always thought you'd get better. Even after the year of dialysis, the kidney pancreas transplant, and the thousands of pills, even after they unexpectedly let you come home from the hospital, and you asked me to push you around the block in your wheelchair. It had been months since you felt the sun on your face. I knew that you were nearly blind, and when we reached the spot where I could see Mount Lassen on the horizon, I told you that it was still holding snow, but you didn't say anything. Sometimes I still feel your fingers on my arm, and I see your eyes on mine. We're always in our living room. A painting of Christ hangs on the wall. You raise your head off the pillow and say, go to Colorado. Two weeks after you died, I boarded a plane in Reno, and although I knew nothing about the military, by the end of that day, I'd stepped off a bus at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. People started yelling at me, and I was confused and scared. Four days into basic training, I found an officer, and I told him I was thinking of leaving, that my father and little sister needed me back home due to the recent hardship, and that this military life wasn't for me. The officer patiently listened to me and said, no one will judge you, Jesse. Do what you need to do. But somehow I stayed, and as I worked my way through the academy, I often used you as motivation. Would you want me to quit? 
Would you really want me to run home? And what if you were looking down on me right, right then? It's this last question that devastated me. You raised me a Mormon, and for a while I believed. You taught me that families would be together forever in this mortal life as, as well as in the afterlife. So when I left the church and questioned everything, the one thing I couldn't give up was the belief that you were somewhere waiting for me. And while you were waiting, what could you see? Did you look away or cringe when I said that I didn't believe in God anymore? When I lied or was cruel? During episodes of self-love or drunkenness? And what are the times when I cheered the bombing videos of Afghanistan or the drone feeds of Iraq? When I once argued that torture was necessary? In those moments, did you have a hard time believing in me? I'll understand if you say yes. I'll understand if you don't answer. I'm sorry, Mom, but I no longer think of you every day. I hate that weeks often pass without a gust of memory that includes you, but then I'll randomly hear a Barbara Streisand song or someone will mention my big nose and I lose control. Last week, I came across a photo of my graduation from the Air Force Academy. In the photo, I stand in between Dad and Josie with the front range of the Rockies in the background. It's four months before 9-11. The Thunderbirds have just roared over Falcon Stadium, and I'm a brand new second lieutenant with no idea of what will be asked of me. But most important, you aren't there. I stared at the photo and went and locked my bedroom door. I sat down on the carpet and wept. I wonder what you think of me now. I want to know if you think I'm a good husband and father. I want your reaction each time I put on my Air Force uniform and tap into the pride I still feel serving in the armed forces. Can I claim a desire for peace while I'm culpable in violence? I want you to judge me. Tell me, if you knew then what you know now, would you still tell me to go to Colorado? Before you answer, I hope you saw the day I met Sarah near the airbase in England where I was stationed, and later on our wedding day, when I stopped in mid-slow dance and told her that I felt you near. Did you hear me tell my children the other night that this woman hugging 10-year-old me in the photo is my mom, and that she died? But they can still call her grandma if they want. I hope you see me struggle with the knowledge that there are things worth fighting for, but that it's been hard as hell for me to know exactly what they are. Comfort me. Let me know I've learned something. Whisper that you hear me preaching the value of empathy to my classroom of academy cadets and that it somehow matters. Please, whisper that it's okay if I fight in a war that I don't understand. Or forget that. Just let me know you remember me. Start anywhere. A wheelchair ride in the sun. A final sentence in our living room. I'm listening for your voice. In your capacity as a professor and lecturer at the U.S. Air Force Academy, and you're currently getting your Ph.D. in Tallahassee while in the armed services, can you explain to people who may not understand or may not even know that this is taking place why the military values providing a fine arts education to their service members and their cadets, including narratives and stories and exposure to art that might be directly contrary to past military <laughs> endeavors and challenging that military narrative? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is we don't want yes men and women. Officer enlisted, every rank, every background. We want folks that are serving in the military in the best way, in my opinion, and I'm biased here, is through reading great and challenging literature, nonfiction, fiction, drama, you name it. The ability to absorb lives that are not our own, the ability to tap into empathy, especially of made-up characters, and to be able to communicate how they feel, how we feel, the ability to investigate our own feelings and challenge our feelings. My experience at the U.S. Air Force Academy as a cadet and then as a professor was 180 out as far as the liberal arts that I expected. I expected narratives that reinforced that 
Um, everything we do is right in America. Every, every type of stereotype of hegemonic power and might makes right is the way to go, and we are purveyors of that, of that system. And what I found and what I'm really proud to cultivate in cadets is a questioning identity, is one to say, what do you believe in? Let's challenge those morals. Let's challenge that world perspective. Because I want a pilot, for example, in the Air Force, I want a pilot questioning everything. The role of the mission, I want them to question the conflict, and I want them to have the reserve of the finest literature and journalism and history at their mental and moral disposal. That's the way that we carry forward and that you can look yourself in the mirror. If you want to go to conflict and and come back, um, one of the tools we can give you, because it's always complicated, but one of the tools we can give you is a deep and abiding um, appreciation of the arts and the sanctity of life. We get that through great literature and art. Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Goolsby, thanks so much for being on Incoming. Thank you so much for having me. Next up, we're going to hear from Adam Stone, retired gunnery sergeant from the United States Marine Corps after 20 years with Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia on his passport, among others. I was lucky enough to meet Adam when he was a student in a writing group I ran at San Diego City College way back in 2014, and the story he's about to tell is the same one we began workshopping together way back then. Getting to watch him perform it in the auditorium there in front of the entire college was a truly incredible experience, and I'm sure you'll feel the same today. So without further ado, I present to you a true story, Oblivion, by Adam Stone. Hello, my name is Adam Stone, and the title of my story is Oblivion. Through my scope, I see him standing there, on the brink of oblivion. I imagine he is contemplating his existence, whether to take that step. He sways with the mild wind, allowing its breeze to caress him like a mother rocks her child. He looks over his shoulder as if to see if someone was there to give him encouragement. There is no one. I imagine he is alone in this world, and that this is his only way. As he turns, the look in his eye has changed. No longer is it fear, but that of determination. He takes the step. I lean closer as if to be able to stop him. I scream in my head for him to go back. My hand instinctively reaches out as though I could push him backwards from over 500 yards away. I close my eyes, cringing at the anticipation of the commotion that is about to occur. Deafening silence. I strengthen my resolve and look back through the scope, watching him walk towards me. I have trained for 20 years to survive in a combat situation, how to fight, to read others, to determine if they are a threat. I've trained for decades to strengthen my mind and body. I've mastered the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I can accurately shoot my rifle and sidearm with near pinpoint accuracy. I've learned to numb my emotions by the loss of my closest friends and seeing what my own rifle can do to the enemy. I can shoot a man in the center of his chest from 500 yards away and put a knife through his throat so close I can count the cavities in his mouth. I've gone through psychological profiles before and after every combat tour to ensure I can still be considered sane. As he walks towards me, all my years of training, my decades of experience vanished like smoke in a breeze. I was lost in a sea of emotion. There he was, a child, no older than my 13-year-old son, walking towards me, but not to me. He was walking to a discarded vehicle left in the middle of an ancient minefield, a leftover from a past war, a constant reminder of the horrors this country has seen. He walks with purpose, knowing that if he makes it to that shattered hulk eroding in the sand, he might be able to find something to sell to the Taliban. He knows that the price is high. The bigger the item, the more destructive it can be, the better off he will be. An old artillery shell can feed him for a month, but anything salvaged can feed him for the day, possibly a week. He knows 
that the Marines guarding the small outpost just 500 yards away are authorized to shoot and kill anyone they deem a threat. His livelihood depends on what he finds, just as the weapon he wears across his back is his way to survive. He's been raised here, and he knows that there is safety in the field that has seen so much death. Many have tried before him. The field is strewn with signs of those who have failed. Shreds of cloth here, a crater there, even a shoe or two are scattered about. He knows that where death once was, he is safe. A landmine can only explode once. He arrives at a crater and jumps inside, resting for a moment, kneeling down as if to pray to his God to give him strength to continue his journey. As he hunkers down into the depression, I see my own children playing at the beach, building sandcastles and burying each other, laughing as they run and jump into holes, not much different from the one the child is resting in now, only 300 yards from my position. From this distance, I can easily hit the target. The wind is slightly blowing from right to left. The sun is behind me, erasing all shadows and highlighting my target. In actuality, it would be an easy shot and be justified under the current rules of engagement. As I sight in on the boy, I make the appropriate adjustments to my rifle. I firmly grasp the pistol grip, pulling it slightly towards me, ensuring the stock of the weapon is comfortably in the pocket of my shoulder. I rest the barrel of my weapon in the palm of my forward hand, allowing it to just lay there until the moment is necessary. My trigger finger hovers next to the trigger, waiting for the moment. My shooting position is perfect. No one, no one would question why I pulled the trigger. I'd more than likely get a few good jobs and hey, wow, from the younger, less seasoned Marines who talk openly about seeing action and wanting to shoot something other than a paper target. Young Marines who have been raised in front of a television screen, playing modern warfare and simulated wars around the world, who also tend to treat life as just another simulation. But there is no reset button, no pause, and no cheat codes. I hold my position, watching the target, with my finger next to the trigger. He lifts himself out of this hole and stands at the threshold, his prize a mere 50 yards away, but it might as well be 100, 1,000, or even 10,000, for the distance isn't the problem, it's what's between and underneath. He takes a step and begins to walk again. As he moves, his eyes are ever vigilant, shifting, searching for a tell in the sand for possible danger. Nothing can be seen. Footstep after footstep, his body tenses that it might be his last. I can see him clearer now. The sweat of his brow, the dirt on his face, and even the beginning of manhood as a slight, wispy mustache is starting to darken above his lip. I can also see he is no stranger to war. A ragged scar runs from where his left ear should be to the corner of his mouth. He is missing two fingers from his left hand, and I postulate that the entire left side of his body is battle damaged in some way. Possibly the effects of a landmine he was fortunate to walk away from. More than likely, as I have seen too many times, when he was an infant, his mother shielded him from the danger, protecting him with her own body, leaving scars as a reminder of her love. I watch closely. He is just 25 yards away. His pace is slow and methodical, choosing each step carefully. I again reminisce of my children when I send them to bed for the evening. The slow, intentional walk down the hall, hoping a reprieve might come, allowing them to watch just one more show. No reprieve ever comes for them, nor will there be for the boy who rests squarely in my sights. He is only yards away, the fruit of his labors within his grasp, my body stiffens, ready to shoot. He climbs into the mangled mass of the vehicle whose ancient armor shields him from my sight. The world envelops me. Behind me, I can hear the distant sound of music playing on a radio. Marines on a break from what lies outside our walls are playing cards to occupy their mind. 
The smell of baked chicken being prepared for the evening meal lofts up to me, and for a moment, I can relax and take in the world. Tick, tick, tick. The hours of the second hand slowly pass. When I see the boy exiting the vehicle, I am funneled back into the reality that lay in my sights. In his hands is a wooden box filled with miscellaneous wires and pieces of scrap metal. Resting on top is his personal fortune, a cylindrical shaped object that resembles an old Soviet mortar shell. The boy doesn't waste any time. He begins crossing the field as fast as possible, attempting to retrace his steps that had brought him to this treasure trove. Thud, thud, thud. The emptying and filling of my heart is now keeping time. I tighten my position, ensuring I can get a clean shot. The boy has now become the enemy. Never mind the rifle he wears across his back. Every six-year-old in this country has one. The mortar shell, if sold to the Taliban, can be used against the Marines and soldiers in the field. He moves quickly. I adjust for his speed. My finger slips into the trigger well. I can feel the warmth of the indifferent still as I apply slight pressure. My weapon is ready. He reaches the crater where I imagine him praying. He abruptly stops. He's frozen. Not a muscle is moving. Can he feel the barrel of my rifle bearing down on him? He's motionless. Beads of sweat roll down the back of his neck. He's breathing heavily. He stands for what seems like eternity. Click. I apply more pressure to the trigger. He slowly lowers the box of goods down from his chest and looks up to the sky. Click. I place my thumb on the safety, ready to unleash the dogs of war. Boom. The outpost siren is wailing. Every Marine from around the compound stops what they are doing and rushes to the perimeter with rifles in hand to defend our position. It takes the cloud of sand and debris from the explosion 10 minutes to finally settle. After a few moments, the all clear is sounded and everyone goes back to what they were doing before. The music starts to play, the games continue, and I helplessly look out across the field of oblivion. A torrent of emotion swells. I'm confused. Was that me? No. My weapon is still on safe. Where's the boy? He's gone. I am thankful. It wasn't me. I didn't have to. I would have. I could have. This time, this time, it wasn't my choice. My soul, though empty, is still intact. I am angry and demoralized. I understand why the boy made the trek. All this child wanted to do was to live, to survive. I think of all the children that have crossed my path, the ones on the side of the road begging for change, the ones in the refugee camps waiting in never-ending lines, even the ones that have stolen from me. They all had one thing in common, the will to survive. That boy was doing what he had to do to survive. He was looking for a way to survive for more than just today, just so we wouldn't have to walk through a minefield tomorrow. As I walk off the plane two months later, I see my children standing there on the edge of the runway. I couldn't help but think of the boy and his trek and all that had happened. I have killed. I have hurt others, justified or not. But I have also loved and cared for my enemy as I have loved and cared for my own children. Now they are all here and together running to me. Hey, thanks for joining us on Incoming, Adam. Why don't we start off with you telling us where you were at in life when you made the decision to join the Marine Corps? I was raised here in San Diego and moved up to the Central Valley my final years of high school. And just to get away from there as fast as possible, I had a couple of choices, work in the fields, 
you know, work in the prisons or be on the other side of the prison um, cage. So I chose the military over all those. Are you from a military family? Or I am. I'm a military brat. I'm a fourth generation military. Kind of friends in our family. Do you kind of feel that as not a, necessarily a pressure, but maybe a predestination coming your way growing up out there, that that was something that was kind of in the cards? Probably a little bit. My grandfather was a World War II vet. And he served in Iwo Jima. My father and his father were both crew in Navy. Uh, so probably to thumb my nose at my father, you know, that last dig as an adolescent was, say, I'm going to join the Marine Corps, not the Navy kind of thing. But, you know, hey, it is. So talk to me about how, wh- when did writing come into your life? Was that something that came in during or after or before joining the service? I think it's always been a part. I've always been told that I'm, I can write, that I always had a way to tell stories and get people involved in what I was thinking. While I was in the Marine Corps, way before the internet and being able to kill time, you know, just surfing the web, I wrote bad poems and, you know, songs about love that I didn't know what the heck it was. I just did what I had to do just to occupy my mind. And one day I started writing a story that was terrible in every aspect of the word, but turned into I something I enjoyed that occupied my mind and kept me out of, you know, the darkness, I guess you would say. What did your experience in, in the service, how did, how did that change your relationship with writing? It gave me a different perspective. Um, I read a lot more. Um, when I was a teenager, I didn't like to read. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to hear anybody else's story. I had my own stories kind of thing. But when you're out there in some ship or in some country that doesn't have anything, you pick up whatever book is possible. You start reading, and I just fell in love with the entire art of it. You were in the Marine Corps for 20 years. Correct. And uh, I've met your wife, your wonderful wife, and you're the father of how many? Four kids. Four kids. Yes. So what's it like being a father and a Marine? It's active duty. It's a juggling act. Um, depending on where you're stationed at, it changes the dynamics of it. There was a time that both of us, both my wife and I were both active duty. So it was a real big juggling act. We finally got stationed here in San Diego, and she resigned from the Mer- from the Navy. We decided that we're going to focus on my career. Um, it was a joint decision, and it was kind of hard. You know, my youngest daughter was born right when we got back to San Diego, and I spent pretty much the next three years deployed, one year-long deployment and one six-month deployment. Um, and so I spent her first three years not really knowing who she was, just through pictures and, you know, little uh, YouTube clips or whatever the heck it's called. Uh, I love you, Daddy. I missed her first words. Um, I missed all the big milestones of her. It was hard, and my twins, they're just as, you know, definitive moment for me was when we were on base, and the my oldest girl, I was in civilian clothes, and she saw a Marine in uniform, and she goes, Daddy, and she pointed to him, and that was kind of a deciding moment, okay, I'm done with this. My kids need to know who I am and not what I wear. The hardest part, I guess, is not having a task. I, I spent the last 20 years with a mission. This had to get done by this time, by this no, there, there was always something that had to be done in very precise order. All of a sudden, when I walked away from the Marine Corps, when I decided to put that as a close that chapter of my life, there was nothing. There was no structure. There was except the structure that I created, and unfortunately, that my structure caused a lot more chaos than what was necessary in the family. Wake up at six, t- breakfast by six thirty, walk to school by seven fifteen, be in class by seven forty five. I'll walk home, I'll do this, do this, A, B, and C. Everything became very rigid, and nobody wanted to be around me anymore. People were looking, you need to go back in the military. It's because that's where you need to belong. So I had to decompress, learn to be something other than a jarhead. You feel like you took your work home with you. <laughs> You're oh, trying I, to recreate it in the family. I didn't take my work home. I created my world. What were some of the factors that got you to kind of, for lack of a better word, relax? My wife. Uh, definitely my wife. She looked at me and says, you need to find a hobby. You need to get a job, find a hobby, or go to school, one of the three. You need to figure it out because this is killing the whole family. I chose the school, you know, figure if I want to be do something and I want to show my kids that education is important, let's go to school. So that's what I've been trudging through for the last almost year now. One of the things that you really touch on in your story that your whole story revolves around is a part of war that I don't really feel like gets talked about very much in, in the media, and that's the the face of children in warfare. Right. You know, when we, when we think about the idea of battle zones, I think that we still have a kind of um, partitioned viewpoint where right. this is where soldiers go. But it's not anymore. These are cities and civilian areas. Well, in every country I've ever been to, it, there's always children involved. You don't think about it as a child. When you're, when you're a, child, a child yourself first joining the military, you don't think about it. Because you hear about stories from Vietnam or World War II, 
um, and other places that you hear about children, the, the, the suffrage of children, but you never can reference it yourself. I don't think you can really reference it until you're a parent yourself where you have someone back home that resembles that face that you're, that's right in front of you. Uh, the enemy is the enemy. I, I can see the enemy any place in the, st in the city as someone that I deem that might be a threat to me. But when it's children, they're helpless. They're innocent. They have, they have no political outlook on life. They have no viewpoints of what the world is going to be like. So they're innocent just like my children are innocent. So it's, it's a hard line to walk when you see that, have to make decisions and not know what's going to happen, what's going to be the repercussion of that decision. So you felt like there was a marked difference in your experience from after you became a father and Definitely. redeployed? Definitely. When, before I was married, um, I was a very quesara sera kind of guy. That's life. Deal with it. But when you see your own children trip and fall and hurt themselves and you know you could have protected them, it's a whole different story than you put yourself in the position of the father of that child or the big brother or whatever you want to call it. Your humanity kind of, show, kind of shows up. You can no longer be that blank stare, you know, looking out and it's like, I'll do whatever it has to do to survive. It's like sometimes somebody else has to survive other than you. Mm. What, do you what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions civilians have about veterans? We all have PTSD, that we're all walking on the edge of a knife that just the smallest thing will, you know, set us off. Do you feel that as when people find out that you're a veteran? Sometimes. When, when they hear how long I've been in, it's where I get the more, it's like, oh, wow. And then I get the questions of, like, what, what made you stay in so long? Some people, depending on the situation that you're in, it puts you in kind of a, a, an edgy mood. For if somebody was about to term out of the military in, say, about two weeks, what piece of advice would you give them? Take a break. If you don't take that break, you're going to be caught up in your own everything that used to be. You need to take a break and take in what the now is. The military is lovely. I, I, I love everything about it. It provided for me and my family, but it's not who we are, you know? It, it's, a, it's a career for some of us. It's a profession for others. It's a job for some. Take a break. You know, learn to decompress and walk away from the uniform for a little bit. It's always going to be inside you. The military changes you, but take a break from it. Figure out who you are and what you want to be for the rest of your life because the military is over at that point. That's our show. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnell. Our musicians are Chris Warren, Ariana Warren, Chris Apple, Kamau Kenyatta, Keith Munslow, and Jeffrey Malecki. Outro music is provided by Tim Koch, a.k.a. 1032 from Ghostly International. At KPBS, Kurt Cohen is our audio engineer, Emily Jankowski is our studio tech, Nate John is our web editor, and Big Papa John Decker is program director. Funding for Incoming is provided by the KPBS Explorer Program, the Veterans Initiative in the Arts by the California Arts Council, and listeners like you. If you'd like to learn more about our programming and how to become involved, please visit us at so say we all online.com we'd love to hear from you thanks so much for listening we'll talk again soon